SciBite is produced by JupiterBroadcasting.com, independent entertainment that's always thoughtful. Check us out. Hi, everyone, and welcome to SciBite. It's Jupiter Broadcasting Science Podcast, and we do it weekly. This episode was streamed live on December 13th for release on December 14th, 2011. My name is Chris, and joining me like every single week is Heather. Hello there, Chris. Hey, Heather. Happy science to you. Happy science. We have, I always say this, but we really do have a big episode. In fact, we were just chatting before the show started. I was going to, I'm saying, well, save it because I want to say this in the show. I'll be honest with you, Heather. Just about every show yeah. we have here on the network kind of slows down in December, typically. It's not a yeah. big news month for technology because everybody goes home. You know, they're not, yeah. they're not making news. Yeah. However, this month, science is not disappointing. We have no. science epicness to cover. So I'm oh, excited yeah. about that. Now, but before we get to that, it's not exactly feedback like we traditionally would cover at the top of the show, but mm-hmm. it, came to me, it came to me on Google+. Plus, and uh, this is just so awesome. I think we might have to cover it in a future episode, but I found out what you would do with a trillion frame per second camera today. And Wired has a write-up on this. It came out of MIT. They can actually watch a light particle photon whatever travel through like say a bottle or something like that have you seen this i briefly saw it like i was cruising the the uh, the science feeds essentially and i saw it very briefly and i just read it where they had a bottle set up and they could record it like traveling one way bouncing off the cap and going back the other way it's so cool it's very neat so uh i'll throw a link to that in the show notes i'll I'll try to remember to do that for you guys you can you can check that out because oh man i mean just to see the way light kind of can paint across something and to think that we can now record something at faster than the speed of light yeah it's like technology or something it's pretty crazy Oh, it was great. Nuts crazy. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Now, okay. Now that's enough screwing around. We got a a big show. And I think all of you know out there that there's just too much plain distraction. I mean, we want our cake and we want to eat it too. There's a lot of interesting things going out there in science, but getting to the interesting bits without all of the hype, that's what we're trying to do here at Jupiter Broadcasting. Something you don't get from the major media outlets. What do we have coming up on today's show, Heather? Today, we're going to take a look at the breaking news on Higgs boson particles, materials tougher than diamonds, inserting objects into pictures, becoming more realistic. Hubble research, research takes a miles, hits a milestone. Dinosaurs, talking parrots, downloadable knowledge, information on the unbelievable lunar eclipse we just had. Quick spacecraft update. And as always, take a peek back into history and up. In the sky. Very cool. Man, that is that really is way packed. That is a massively packed one. So let's hit the news first. All right, what's up first in the news this week? All right, so Higgs boson particles. Uh don't sure not sure if everybody knows these, but they're elementary particles that are theoretically what give atoms and subatomic particles their mass. And they think that it's just like this everywhere these particles are and they just make everything slow down around them think like a party like a a busy like get a big house and a party and some celebrity walks in people kind of flock around the celebrity (laughs) and as the celebrity moves people kind of flock back to the conversations they were having so it's like things slow down around them so maybe it's slowing the things down around it is this what i've heard referred to as the god particle yeah this is the quote-unquote god particle I mean, the theory for it's been around 50 years or so, but the Large Hadron Collider, that's the big super collider in Europe that goes yeah. across Sweden. That, well, we've talked a little know, bit is, about it before. We talked a little about it before. That's where the neutrino stuff is coming out of. Higgs boson particles are one of the main reasons why it was built, to look oh. for these things. Oh, okay, okay. This is like so, their mission. Yeah, it was one of the major missions of this. So the tricky part is finding them are seeing the tracks for them. Think of it like, okay, so you've got a big football field and you can look one tiny yard at a time and somewhere in the football field, there's a piece of grass that's just a little bit greener than everything, all the others. <laughs> and it's not always in the same spot. I mean, it, it's in the same yard position. It's like at the 52 yard line or something. Sounds like a pain in the butt. But it's just like traveling up and down and it's not always there. And all you can do is look one yard at a time. Wow. So you're kind of like, take a whole bunch and you're 
there was two experiments that are kind of narrowing in, looking in. So they kind of kept saying, nope, not here. Nope, not here. And they kind of narrowed it down to this small area. So, th- yeah, so that's kind of a key thing, huh? They're not able to observe uh, this God particle directly. They have to sort of observe the effect that it creates. Kind of. Now, what they're doing is they're smashing together protons. And this year alone, I think they had 400 trillion proton-proton collisions. Oh. And during these collisions, it's possible that certain of these subatomic particles that blast off, some of them might be Higgs boson particles. Now, they'll sort of change or devolve very quickly, but there's a chance that you could see them very briefly. And in July, there were some data spikes at a certain area where we think the Higgs boson particle would, would lie. Hmm. In a, in a specific mass where all the, the theories and the mass is, uh, I think it's going to be around here. So this was an area they were already kind of watching with some, with some interest? Yeah, I mean, they were sort of narrowing into that zone. So like, let's see, it shouldn't be less than this, but let's check it. It shouldn't be more than that, but let's check it. Sort of narrowing down into this most interesting zone. Gotcha. And today, in fact, was, or Tuesday when we recorded the show, was the day that they revealed some results. Yeah, now this was interesting because there was a big press announcement. Hey, we're going to have something. They even streamed it live, right, on the internet, yep. which was cool. Yeah. So what was it? So what it is is they highlighted 10 candidates out of that 400 trillion, 10 times they think they saw some Higgs particles. Uh, whoa. So, a, I mean, <laughs> that's, not a it's very, only, that's not a very good odd. It's only a handful. So they're not saying it's real because mm, okay. it, it's... You have to have much more evidence for it to be real. It's one of those things where, like, we think we, we might be onto something, though. This could be. Yeah. Av- they, okay. We're pretty sure we're onto something. They won't confirm it until at earliest summer of next year. Okay. But it was two separate experiments that are both seeing this data in the same area. Hmm. It's um, at the 125 giga electron volts, which is so like 212. Uh, 124 giga electron volts is about 200 quintillionths of a gram. That's a point followed by 14 zeros. Wow. Okay. Jeez. So really tiny. <laughs> but so these there's these ten ev- there's these ten things. So they're not 100 percent sure whether it's just background noise mm. or mm. whether it's real. Um, they'll so- you know they'll say you know. They have three sigma, which is, that's what they are now. It's like the chances of tossing a coin and having it fall on heads eight times in a row. Yeah. Now, in order for them to claim a discovery, it's like a one in a million chance that the data spike would be real. And that, that's like tossing a coin and landing it on the heads 20 times in a row. If so- that happens, then they'll say... Yes. Okay, yeah, so that means something. All right. So now, uh, Crash mm-hmm. Benedict is asking in the chat room, and I have to, I have to ask as well, like, what does it tell us if they, say, confirm that this Higgs boson or God, God particle exists? What, what breakthrough is that? Well, it's one of the, the things about the standard model. It's telling us why subatomic particles do what they do, why they have the mass that they do, why do protons weigh this much, and why do neutrons weigh that much. So I it's... See. We, we don't quite understand it. We just kind of say, we're starting from here, and we'll make all assumptions after that. Jackson's laughing at me calling it the Hicks, the Hicks, bog- the Hicks bogus. <laughs> the Hicks bogus. <laughs> yeah, it's the Hicks particle. Yeah. It, you know, it has, you know, little toilets for, for what, um, flower beds in the front yard and everything. It just kind of chills out. <laughs> all right. Anything else on that story? Um. No, I mean, that's, that's the main thing is they'll, they made such a big deal about it, but I kind of knew leading up into it. I was like, they're not going to say for sure. They're probably going to say, we have some promising data. Yeah. Tune yeah. back next time for more information. Right. Find out I mean, when we can, you know, yeah, yeah. Well, they, well, they, they kind of, it kind of seems like they sort of like drip this stuff out to be like, look, we're accomplishing things. Remember this big expensive thing you hear about? Well, we, we, we are discovering things right now. And uh, yeah. if you keep, if you keep uh, funding our research and you keep supporting us, then you'll get more information very soon. And you know what? Yeah. As, as rightly they should. Well, yeah. I mean, to some degree for physicists and these people that care about it, it is really big news. It's like, whoa, they're actually seeing, they're starting to see the data. 
you know, right. they've narrowed down into the right place. Now it's just, you know, running enough experiments to make sure it's not noise or to make sure that it's real. But right, it, right. I mean, to certain to certain populations, it's really exciting. It's a really big deal. Yeah, yes. absolutely. It sounds like it could be, and it sounds like uh, we will hear more at some point, but no, yeah. sh- not for sure when. Yeah, summer of next year is probably the earliest or when you should expect more, more knowledge about this. Now, uh, I have to ask you, I mean, I'm sitting here, I'm, I'm ready to just challenge the hell out of this science. You're, you're going to come on this podcast and tell me yep. that they have discovered something m- stronger than diamonds. All right. So this is kind of a tricky thing. They're these, they're these super hard materials. This challenges everything I believe. I know. <laughs> so diamonds are carbon, you know, carbon that's been crushed and, you know, into tiny hard things. Right, right. I mean, like the pencils in the, the lead in your pencil is, you know, almost very similar. Hmm. Now, what, can, what we've discovered is that we can actually put enough force so that these molecules fold in on themselves. They become huh. even tougher. Now, they'll say, you know, they come out with this and they'll say, oh my gosh, it's tougher than diamonds. But what you have to realize that is there's different ways of saying this. That, you know, it's able to cut, able to scratch, hmm. stronger, tougher, denser. All of these are very different things. I mean, right. they shape diamonds. Right. Oh, yeah. So. It, I mean, some of these sort of have a grain like wood. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So there's a certain hardness where they'll say, you know, this material can cut it essentially along the grain. You know, so there, it has a certain flow and this material can cut along that flow. It can't cut the other way against the grain. But it can cut this way or mm-hmm. this material is that dense. So essentially these materials, some of them are theoretical, some of them are real. They're saying... That they can get these carbon molecules, you know, formed up together and sort of start folding them in on themselves so that they become denser. They start changing their, their shape and how they act. Like a piece of paper, when you fold it and fold it and fold it, it becomes stronger and stronger and stronger. Yeah. That's so you're funny. folding it on yourself like origami and it just becomes, it's the same sheet of paper. It's just becoming more dense, essentially. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Hmm. So, you know, harder, stronger, the ability to cut. They're all really unique properties. So, I mean, they'll sometimes come out and be like, this is harder. This is denser. This is stronger. You know, and we all have this diamond is the toughest thing out there. Yeah, that's what but, I always thought. Yeah. Yeah. But there are very specific, you know, things that maybe it beats it out in this way. Maybe it beats it out in that way. Hmm. So. Go. Well, like um, you said, they got to cut something with diamonds. They got to cut those diamonds with something. <laughs> yeah. Now, sometimes it is just other yeah. diamonds. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, it is. You're right. But another thing that's interesting is there is a long standing puzzle in astronomy where interstellar dust, when you look at it in a specific way, is much, it's distorted and it's a deep red that would require much more carbon than we thought was there. But if carbon can be folded in on itself, huh. like we're, we're discovering it can, then it would change the light to more red with just being the same amount of carbon so it's tantalizing knowledge that perhaps you know what we're starting to do in the lab is actually happening out there already and it would sort of explain this specific thing that we're seeing in the universe but then they got to figure out how does it happen naturally yeah well it's pressure so there are specific things in the universe that that create a great deal of pressure yeah i mean stars uh, supernovas all these kind of things that can just wave and sure, kind of sure. create a wave of very dense stuff going on. Hmm. Yeah, that is, boy, wouldn't that be awesome if we can, if we find out, if that would explain a little bit of what those clouds are out there. That's, that's pretty great. Oh, that's yeah. Great. Now, uh, anything else on that particular story? Anything else I you want to cover on that? Yeah, I was trying to click around. I mean. It's, it's one of those things where uh, it kind of boggles my mind because I, I can't quite fathom how they would use it in actual everyday life, but I know there's a use for it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I, I, mean, I can only imagine that's always something that they can, but I just don't know what. Can't yeah. Think of well, um, I know there are specific things. Now I'm trying to, off the top of my head, are looking in my 
awesome show notes that have way too much information. Yeah. <laughs> then I'm trying to go back and find things. Your own show notes are hard to go through. But we yeah. do have links but, in the show notes for all this. Yeah. People always say uh, that are new to the show, what are the show notes? And the show notes, you go over to jupiterbroadcasting.com and then you click on the episode of SciBite, like this one would be episode 25. And then you just scroll down below the video, all of the show notes are there. Links to stuff, tons of extra information, um, but multiple sources, all kinds of great stuff. So there you go. Well, uh, I was I was mentioning that some of these are theoretical, and they're are just sort of using specific type of analysis right. to make these, right? Which is specific computational methods to sort of do this, you know, in the computer, saying if this happens, what would it do? And if this particular material existed, in how it, would it act? Yeah, exactly. That makes sense. That makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um, all right, are you ready to move on? I am. Well, then let's take a quick pause here and uh, mention Star Wars, The Old Republic. Now, uh, this is our pick for this week. (laughs) We should because uh, Heather is a soldier and she is taking a break from playing on the early access right now to do uh, (laughs) SciBite. I'm so dedicated to science. (laughs) It's it's actually pretty impressive. I actually asked her, like, do you do you need to postpone the show? Because we can we can postpone the show. She's like, no, the show must go on. Uh, If you're thinking about picking up The Old Republic and uh, you haven't get you haven't done it yet, I'll put a link in this week's show notes and if you buy it through there Jupiter Broadcasting gets a little percentage of the purchase and then also uh, if you're doing some shopping maybe over at Think Geek this year or uh, Newegg there'll be a link in the show notes where if you click on those links before your shopping session we get a percentage of that shopping session doesn't cost you anything more but it's a great way to support uh, SciBite and Jupiter Broadcasting and get yourself a little something too and of course our pick for this week had to be I mean had to be Star Wars or Republic Oh, yes. I may or may not have been up at 4 a.m. this morning checking it out. <laughs> I think Waiting for my were. access. <laughs> but yes, I always, you know, doing my holiday shopping. I definitely click that. Oh, well, I multiple, appreciate that. Multiple gifts go out. And That's awesome. Anyone who has not tried out Tor should definitely go check it out. Yes, Ask indeed. And also uh, in the show notes, I have a link to our book pick, our Audible pick, book pick from last week, which is The right. Lost Fleet, the Dauntless one, which is the first in a series of awesome awesome space books with incredible mm-hmm. epic space battles oh my gosh you guys so uh, check the show notes if you guys want that but uh with all of that said what do you say we move on to the SciBite news bite all right what's first in the news bite section heather all right triggering the eye with photographs hmm. now with if you have a photograph and they digitally insert something most people can spot it pretty quickly oftentimes with lighting inconsistencies you know there's lack of a shadow it does not have the right you know light on it it's not bouncing off other things sure, yeah plenty of things that you could like for like in cg often lead to the uncanny valley look and things like that yeah and especially with a mix of live action and cg yeah that's yeah, where it really sure. comes down i mean in cg you can just sort of lay everything out and try to make up for that by saying here's the light shine it this way mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But what a team at the University of Illinois did was they said, all right, let's take just like an old photograph, any sort of photograph, extract it into a 3D scene of information. Oh, this is cool. Oh, this is crazy. So then they can go back and post and add like different light sources and stuff. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. What you do is you sort of, the user sort of draws in, like, here's the room, here's the light source. And it'll go through and it'll say, all right, well, and you can do objects as well. So there's one of them that um, there's billiards and they will bounce off the billiard table. There's, you know, a ball will bounce off a chair. I mean, you, you know, know, this if, is like a step one is figure this technology out. And then step two is figure out holographic projection. And then step three is holodeck. Yeah. Oh, well, of course. <laughs> Okay, good. As long as you agree with that. <laughs> oh, obviously. That's obviously step C. <laughs> it kind of seems where they're going with this, right? I mean, how do you take a 2D object, a 2D photo, and then create a three-dimensional CG model out of that? That's really impressive. Yeah, well, it's a program so that you scan it in, and then it'll bring up little blue lines. And then you, like, click the line, and you bring it up into, say, this is the corner of the room, this is the other corner of the room, here's, like, a little object, here's, like, a footstool, or here's the couch. Oh, here's you know, the edge of the billiard table. That and process. This is the window. 
that have lives a, in the light. We have a video of the process in the show notes. And, that, and this process actually reminds me quite a bit of what it looks like when movie studios go back and convert a two movie, 2D movie into a 3D movie. Is they go mm-hmm. through and they do these similar kind of markers and they analyze the shots like this. Yeah. But it's this sort of thing where, you know, it'll go in and it'll add the shadows. You know, you'll have, you know, a ball roll into the scene and it'll know, oh, I must bounce off this footstool and bounce off the chair. And so it takes go a fair amount of human interaction at this point. Yeah, it takes a little bit of human interaction, but you just sort of have to indicate what objects you want it to interact with. That's amazing. I mean, I love like what the chat room is talking about. Like they're saying it's going to make uh, developing like urban style shooter games great. It could make mm-hmm. like laying out a, a, a new office floor plan super awesome. Yep. Um, it could one make. Of the, Go ahead. One of, yeah. One of the, the big things that they're looking forward to is, you know, decorators could fill a room with whatever they wanted to or games, you know, could. Or, or think about just reenacting like a crime scene or, or yeah. science experiments where you could factor in how something, would, how an object would respond in a different environment based on the other oh, yeah. things in that environment. Yeah. And you could just like have the picture and say, you could even go back to older scenes where there is, you know, if they come out with some sort of 3D imaging, you know, where you can have the camera side by side and get a little 3D mm-hmm. into it. But you could take an old 2D picture, scan it in, do a little bit of analysis on it, and then it's suddenly in a 3D format. That is so neat. Huh. Kind of kind of makes me want to be able to combine that with, say, something like Connect. And 3D yeah. goggles. So you get a nice big screen going. You get, you know, let's just pretend like maybe it could do this kind of thing on the fly in the future. You combine yeah. that with Connect, where it can actually see you and it could place you in that environment. Oh, yeah. Oh, that'd be fun. Now that oh, is yeah. a good game. Yeah. Like some of the images in the, in the video, some of them are more realistic. Some of them are less mm-hmm. realistic, mm-hmm. especially people who are, like, you know, gamers and can sort of spot. Mm. The, they might, they the might th- stick their nose up at it a bit it. in some cases. Yeah, you can still spot it just a little. Mm. Some images are way better than others. Some of them I was like, yeah, I can kind of see that the fakiness in that one, Mm -hmm. you know, but others I'm like, wow. Yeah. Yeah. This is really crazy. That's a good find. That's a good little science find. How did you come across that? I have all sorts of science sites. I peruse every day (laughs) looking for the cool stuff. And this one kind of looked cool. And then I saw that video and I was like, must go in the show. (laughs) <laughs> must go in the show you know it was right up my alley too because i oh, love yeah. that kind of stuff all right should we uh should we move on to the next story here in the uh in the side bite news bite yes. all right now this one's interesting because it's an update from uh like uh like the milestone of the types of data or the amount of data we've collected from hubble what's this about the number of scientific papers from oh. hubble observations have it ten thousand. Ten thousand. not just bits of data but there's ten thousand scientific publications based on the observations from Hubble. Hmm. That's thousands of astronomers over 35 countries, um, you know, all sorts of these, these bits of data and these research grants and, you know, studies. And the other interesting thing that I, I kind of found along with this was just the archive data from Hubble, excluding all the new, the new stuff that they, they keep going. If you just take all the archival data, it's over a million exposures. And it actually, and the papers built off that have actually eclipsed the number of papers coming from new observations. You know, like there is, there are more papers coming out today based on the archival footage from Hubble than new observations from telescopes everywhere. Isn't that interesting? Because that that touches on something. We we, we've talked a lot about how there's so much data just in the data that they can continue to mine that, but. Yes. What's also interesting about that, and this kind of um, changes a misconception I had, I think maybe because I've heard that Hubble's coming to an end at some point. I, I've been under the mistaken impression that Hubble was kind of busted down and not working that great. I, but based on, based on archival data and, mm-hmm. and new data coming in, if you look at this chart you have in the show notes, Hubble's actually supplying us with more information in 2010 than it was back when it launched, or really, honestly, oh, yeah. in the first... 10, 11 years of its active duty, it never submitted as much data to us as it is now in 2010. Yeah, well, right at first, I'm sure some people recall, Mm -hmm. others may not, it had some issues, it needed a pair of glasses, you know, and there were various things and upgrades that, you know, there have been five shuttle servicing missions 
uh, up to 2009 where they did things. They, you know, added his glasses, they upgraded this instrument or that instrument. But there are still, you know, for every time slot on Hubble, there have got to be at least three scientists like begging for that spot. They're like, please, sir, please, here's our research. May we have a time period? Yeah, yeah, I know. You, you, that's why it drives me so crazy that it is coming to an end. Yeah, well, without the shuttle servicing missions, what are you there's, do? There's, yeah, there's only so much you can do. It's gyroscopes. Will We're at a certain point. It won't be able to maintain its orbit safely. And then once it can't, then they'll be forced to bring it down in a controlled fashion so that, I mean, the Earth is two-thirds water, but you still want to bring it in a controlled fashion so that it makes sure it splashes in the water. Right. As in, i.e., the Earth is two-thirds water, so there's a really good chance you're not going to hit land, but there's also a chance you might hit land unless it's controlled. Yeah, so... Now, you have a story in here about giant dinosaurs. <laughs> what it looks oh, like... Oh, Or you goodness. have it labeled as giant lizard, actually. I shouldn't call it a dinosaur, but it, to me, it looks like a dinosaur. What is this? Well, the terrible lizard is what they started, where dinosaur comes from. It literally meant terrible lizard. <laughs> terrible. So I was like, terribly large lizard. Ah, uh, gotcha. So they've just unearthed a vertebrae of, you know, one of those Apatosaurus types where, you know, Alamosaurus, where it's, you know, giant dinosaur, big, long neck, tiny head at the one end, yeah, big, long, long tail at the other. If you watch The Land so, Before Time, they're called long necks. Yeah, the long necks, of course. Mm -hmm. So they've just discovered what has going to become the North America's largest dinosaur oh. ever on Earth. Oh, okay. Cool. Called the Alamosaurus sanwanesis. Pretty sure I did that right. <laughs> A cousin of the Diplodocus, which more people would possibly have heard of. But, you know, it's all these breeds of these long neck creatures that roamed 69 million years ago. So they just sort of stumbled across it in the New Mexico desert back in 2004. And they finally got the, this vertebrae. That's all they've had is this one vertebrae. And it's funny. It's like the story is it took these two people. These like, it was just two paleontologists out in the field. And they had to travel 1.2 miles back to the truck. This thing is huge. Oh, my god! I mean, I think it went up to like the chest of, of, of the, the dude. guy. Yeah, of the dude. Yeah, yeah, of the dude. And he's not like a little dude. No. No, he's a full-size dude. He's probably 5'11", yeah, maybe dude. 6 this foot, and then they've got this massive piece. Yeah, so these, like, two paleontologists have to trek it over a mile to the truck. <laughs> well, of course, they're going to, though, because it's such a massive find, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And so, but this, this vertebrae is the only, you know, well, it may not be the only piece, but it, the full skeleton is not found yet. And this happens sometimes with specific dinosaur types, mm. where they'll find pieces of the skeleton and they can kind of track it and say this is very much like that dinosaur but on a different scale it's slightly different and then sort of reverse engineer the the bones and the wear patterns on the bones huh. the size of the bones to say this is kind of what we think the dinosaur is going to be now, the more skeleton you get the better um the better idea you can do but what was interesting is also where it was located this was they found a lot more of this type of dinosaur, like the cousins of this dinosaur in South America. And so they're, but they only go up to a certain degree in North America. So the question, were they traveling? Were they kind of migrating north? Did maybe at a certain point the weather didn't agree with them or huh. Huh. the environment didn't agree with them with some way? Or just that, that is as far as they went? Could be like a climate change situation, huh? Maybe they, went, yeah. maybe they migrated and they died? Yeah, so... That's kind of a, a new kind of interesting question that's, that's coming up with this is that, you know, the location of where you find these di dinosaurs as well, sort of, hmm, this is where they were. This is where this one was. You know, what was the environment like? And this is how they kind of travel. You can see this type of dinosaur, then that type of dinosaur, you know, moving in different ways. Mm -hmm. So you can be able, it gives you a lot of data in that sense as well. That's pretty neat that we're still discovering stuff like that. I, you know, I kind of, I always, mm -hmm. I take that for granted and kind of think that that kind of stuff had been found by now, but we're always digging up more stuff, I guess. Yep. There's, there's constantly different things being, being dug up or uh, completions to skeletons that, you know, we've started to have parts of skeletons and we sort of fill it in or we find, I know in the past year, they found a couple of nests of dinosaurs where that information says, you know, if they find them of different sizes, then they say, huh, the, these dinosaurs stick around with their family for a while. 
this is probably not just one nest. This is maybe, you know, anti, mm -hmm. um, anti dinosaur takes care of the herd while everyone else goes out, um, you know, grazing and take a break from the kids. Um, oh, that sounds like a nice aunt, really. Yeah. And then it's her turn later and everyone else has to watch the babies. Um, <laughs> So it kind of gives us information. Parties. Let me tell you what. Oh Mars. yeah, that dinosaur ant is crazy. Yup, you get on the other side of the river, and that. Oh man, <laughs> it's a party what happens on the other side of the river stays on the other side of the river. <laughs> Especially if they die over there and then get discovered by uh, archaeologists uh, thousands of years later. Yeah, uh, that's kind of one of the fun things, you know. As a a, a paleontologist joke, it's like you know they're like if they have a doctorate degree, it's like oh you're a doctor. Oh well, you know my my joint hurts. Yeah, I'd only be interested in your joint if it was, you know, petrified and 10,000 years old, at least. <laughs> so, right. find somebody else. Um, any other thoughts on this story? Uh, no, I don't think so. All right, now there is one question. Maybe maybe we could finally answer it in this episode of Sci-Bite. That would really be terrific. I, I, I could, for as long as I remember, have always wondered, how do parrots talk? Yeah, it's without teeth, without lips. How, how do they talk? How is that possible? I actually, I kid, but I actually have kind of wondered. So science actually yeah. has taken a crack at this, hasn't it? Yeah. They've taken, you can take x-ray movies. So it's like, not just like a single, hold still, click. They can take movies of these. And they didn't get a parrot, but they got a monk parakeet that they put in. And they have a very, it's only a second or two, but this very short x-ray movie. And what they see is as the parrot vocalizes, it's actually moving its tongue. It has a very mobile tongue. It's, they use it to manipulate their food. But the, the way that they move their, their tongue can sort of simulate that. So the hope is kind of if parakeets um, do that, probably parrots do that as well. Interesting. That, they have like a really quick video of it. And yeah, he's kind yeah. of like manipulating his tongue to sort of probably smack out different sounds. Yeah. That's and so it's like he's smacking out his little, uh, his little, hey, come over here. What you doing tonight? <laughs> Miss uh, other pair of keys. Or he's saying cracker. So think, he might just be saying, I want a cracker. <laughs> you know, yeah, he might be saying that. Um. <laughs> That's pretty funny though. So there really is a scientific explanation to it. Yep. It's their really mobile tongues that are sort of, do something and it creates specific sounds. And so that's, they're thinking that's where parrots would come from as well, is that they're just using their tongue to simulate these sounds and, you know, welcome you home and call you dirty names. and Right, right. And learn your curse words and then expose your secrets to your friends. Those kinds yep. of things. Those, those adorable yeah. things. Yeah. Um, now, our, our next story in the news bite has some potentially good news for those of you who are a fan of The Matrix. I think probably everybody remembers that scene where they yep. jack in and then they download Kung Fu to, or whatever it was, or how to fly in a uh, helicopter in The Matrix, yep. right, to uh, the different yeah. uh, people. Now, this actually, is this happening? What do we have here in the story? So, what the, it's the beginnings of it. Okay, it's, all right. You gotta, doing you gotta is, start somewhere. Yeah. So, what they can do is they can take these... MRIs, that it's a functional MRI, where they can sort of see as your brain is thinking and doing, where the blood flow is. And we've sort of mentioned these before. What they can do is they show you a picture and sort of see or have you visualize something that say where in the brain it's happening, hmm. have you know specific neurofeedback. Mm -hmm. And so what they're trying to do is get these ways to sort of reverse engineer it. Can you use those decoded MRIs to, to, manually induce, trigger something? to induce some brain activity huh. in that known area that it happens? So you watch a computer screen and something on the computer screen triggers certain brain patterns to match those. So, so you're sort of learning something without being aware of it. And they actually figured out that they could do it without the person knowing what they were actually supposed to be learning. No they were kidding. able to that they were able to make these sort of changes without the participants knowing what the goal was. They're just like, la la la. It's like, oh, now I know this. Well, now that seems pretty significant. That seems really significant. Yeah. And so, but there are some questions. There are how flexible are the visual areas in your brain? So how much can you download? Mm. With certain people, there could be like have, a session yeah. capacity kind of thing. 
yeah, it's, you know, uh, osmosis. You know, how much can the sponge pick up? How much can your book pick up? Oh, man. Daxum you know, in the chat room, Mars, he points out that this the first thing I could see this getting used for is, you know, um, marketing by marketers to uh, sublimity transplant stuff into your brain, like through TV ads or billboards or yeah. things like that. Yeah, they're there were subliminal messages and commercials and they made speci- there were certain laws and things created to make up for that where you couldn't do subliminal in TV shows or commercials yeah, so right, that it right. sort of protected the people. So right. there'll probably be laws to follow up with this where you can't do that sort of a thing. Yeah. I mean, it would be useful in the sense that you could have people that were very, it could help with learning for memory loss. If you had some, some sort of memory loss or rehabilitation. Somebody's had a major injury to the brain. So you could sort of help them relearn specific things. That could be incredible for patients with uh, like, yeah, or, you know, even to trigger, probably even to recover like repressed memories perhaps or something like that. Oh man, there's some potential there. Yeah. Now on the flip side, it could also be used for, you know, I mean, it could be used for hypnosis as well. So you could try to, you know, cure someone of a fear of flight or small spaces or large spaces, that kind of thing. Of course, it could also be used as covert mind control. Exactly. Yeah, it could very well be. Some would say yeah. maybe it already is. Cue the creepy music. One? Yeah, cue creepy uh, conspiracy music, which I don't have uh, handy here. Um, okay. Any others? Any other thoughts on that one? No, I mean that's that's pretty much sort of very early stages. You know, just sort of an interesting tidbit of they're working on this and mm-hmm. our stuff in our shows is coming true. That is true. It has yeah. often happened. Yeah, yeah. All right, well, let's talk about the lunar eclipse over this last weekend because, man, was it incredible. And there yes. are some updates, right? Yes, there were a couple things about it that I didn't quite realize. Oh. So people know, um, or people may not know, a lunar eclipse is when the sun, the earth, and the moon all line up. So the moon is sitting right in Earth's shadow. So it'll light up red very often. It could do anything from orange to red, depending on the things in the atmosphere. You could um, Volcanoes, you know, sticking ash into the air can make a, make a difference. So the light sort of goes through the atmosphere and what little light there is bending around through the atmosphere shines on the moon. So, however, there, this specific instance you could actually see the moon setting and the sun rising at the same time. Oh, okay. Even though they're supposed to be in a straight line, uh-huh. you could still see them both above the horizon. And it's because when you see the sun rise and when you see the, sun, uh, the moon set or either one going either direction, they're not exactly quite where you see them. When you see the sun setting, it's actually already set. It's the light bending in the atmosphere that creates the illusion of where it is. So, in this case, the moon, in order to make the lunar eclipse, the moon is already set. The moon has not, the sun has not risen yet. But the atmosphere is bending both up just a little mm-hmm. so that you can actually see them both at the same time. This is a really rare occurrence. It's called selenelian, I believe. I'll take it. But, I couldn't do any better myself. Yeah. But it was a really rare occurrence. I think it, most of the U.S. and parts of and Canada could actually see this. But it was kind of crazy. We were there for a few minutes, even though it shouldn't be completely possible. I think it was six minutes max that you could actually see both at the same time. I got robbed. We had an incredibly thick fog here in Washington. Oh, no. And I, I, I tried. I tried. But you know what? I couldn't even see the sky. It couldn't, I could barely yeah. see past my roof of my house. It was really thick. Oh, man. Robbed Mars. Robbed. Yeah. And the next complete lunar eclipse won't happen until April of 2014. That's like forever away. I know. God, that's a bummer. Well, I hope people out there got a chance to see it. I, I heard from yeah. a few folks in the audience that said they did get to see it. So I know at least a, f- a few guys got to see it. Excellent. Now, uh, yeah. Oh, well, yeah, definitely. Um, there's also one thing I wanted to ask you, because I know you told us before, but mm-hmm. below the moon just a bit, there's one incredibly bright planet, I think, just below. Do you remember which one that was? Uh, Jupiter was pretty close to the moon. I believe now Mars is kind of in the general direction of uh, the moon. Oh, maybe I'm looking at Mars then. That could be really cool. Well, you never know. You never know. Yep. All right. We got one more story here in the SciBite news section, and that is yep. a spacecraft update. What do you got for us? 
So the Dawn spacecraft is going to a couple of asteroids, one of them Vesta. Hmm. Um, it was, this was the fourth asteroid ever discovered. So it's a pretty big one. And it's kind of interesting, but the Dawn spacecraft has now entered its closest orbit for the asteroid. So it's going to get its highest resolution, best data starting right now. Awesome. So it'll, it, will plan, it plans to visit other asteroids, but this is the biggest one and it's as close as it's going to get. There's a couple of links in the show notes for its website and all the information from it. Cool, cool. Now, uh, do we know, did you mention when we is supposed to arrive? Do we know? I don't it's, remember. Let's see. I only reason, the only reason I'm really asking is because, of course, I want mm-hmm. to cover it in SciBite. You know me. Well, it's the it's not as close as a pro, as close as orbit right now. Oh, oh okay. Well, it then we are covering it. it. <laughs> yeah, we are. I, thought, I misunderstood. I thought you said it was on the way. That's awesome. But it had been on its way, and the news this week is that it's now reached its its closest orbit. There, it's you know it's been orbiting for a little while, but this orbit is the one where it's the tightest. It's the closest. Gotcha, gotcha. All right. Well, mm-hmm. um, cool. I like that Mars. That's really mm-hmm. awesome. There's some great images in the uh, in the show notes for folks, too. Are you ready yep. to uh, move on to the science calendar? I had one other thing that I wanted to throw back to the beginning of the show real oh, quick. Oh, cool. In the Large Hadron Collider, I almost forgot to mention mm. until now, okay. there is actually an Android app that you can go and get some of the latest, <laughs> not all the data, of course, <laughs> but it'll tell you sort of some of the biggest, the largest news and has little games of search for the Hadron, do this. It's oh, sort of just a cool. just sort of a very, you know, low level thing about what they're doing. But it is actually from the official Large Hadron Co- Collider people. It's not just some random person. Cool. There you go. You can find that mm-hmm. in the Android market, huh? Do you remember what it's called? Just probably could just search for LHC or something. You probably find yeah, it. Yeah, and I I know I put it in the show notes. Oh, okay. There you go. All right, all right. Now are you ready for the science calendar? Yes. Well, you know that means up front we jump into the Cybite time machine. Oh, because we got to go back in time and find out what was happening mm-hmm. this week in science. Um, and uh, Mars does that just about every week right here, unless uh, for some reason time stops and we don't have a past to tell you about. Our first yeah. one up is December 15th, 1612, mm-hmm. 399 years ago. What do we got? We've got the first time a telescope looked at the Andromeda galaxy. Now, it was seen through the telescope by the same man who named... Jupiter's four, the big four moons, oh. Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. So that's obviously close to our hearts. Yeah, absolutely. Now, he wasn't the first person to spy the, the galaxy at all. Now, it is our nearest spiral galaxy, not necessarily the closest anything galaxy, but the next spiral galaxy, which is similar to our own. There was a Persian astronomer um, a while before him that sort of wrote about it, sort of a, hey, there's a fuzzy thing in this area. But, <laughs> but Simon even what it was, Mary, exactly. Well, there's a lot of fuzzy things in this area or that area and <laughs> right. stars that move weirdly, which were planets. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. The planet was actually from the name, like it started from being wandering star hmm. because of the way the orbits, it was sort of go along and then it was sort of loop back hmm. and then continue going in the same direction. So they didn't follow the rules of all the other stars. They went in different directions. So it's like, they just called it wandering star because it didn't pay attention to where it was supposed to go. It just sort of wandered around <laughs> in certain ways. That's cool. Hmm. All right. Okay. So let's, uh, let's talk about 204 years ago, December 14th, 1807. Mm-hmm. 204 years ago. That's pretty crazy. Meteorites get science. Oh, okay. So in Connecticut, 6.30 a.m., a meteorite that was... From the ground, looked about two thirds the size of the moon. So all the little the local townspeople say they heard three loud explosions. It fell from the sky, broke apart into at least six, you know, hit the ground at least six locations. And so it was the first one in the New World in North America to be seen as it fell, found on the ground, and then analyzed. There you go. So they had years ago. Yep, and it was. It now resides in one of the oldest collections of meteorites in the U.S. Uh, the, the largest piece was about 350 pounds. Whoa. It's now in the Yale Peabody Museum. And it's kind of an interesting track that this thing took. Um, 
you know, they, there's these two professors and they kind of went around the town trying to gather up everything to do chemical analysis on it. And one of the pieces fell into this farmer's land. Hmm. And all the townspeople were like, God, oh man, these, these professors really need this. And it's, it's really cool. You got to give it to them. And he's like, yeah, no, I'm selling this. So they tried to sell it and tried to sell it and finally sold it to a collector. Mm. And the collector took it and held it. And then that collector's whole collection ended up at the same museum or the same <laughs> university that was trying to take it in the first place. All right. Okay. So I guess in the long run, it worked out okay. Yeah. Now of that, you know, well, it was 350 pounds of the entire meteorite, but only about 50 pounds of the whole thing, people know where it is. The rest oh, of it's really? either in small pieces or gathering dust on mantle pieces in old farmhouses. So there could be some people that have uh, some unclaimed meteorite on their mantle. Yes. Now there is, you know, a market for it. There are people who go out and search for meteorites specifically and, you know, trade and, and sell these things. Oh, sure. Yeah. So, and it still goes on today. Right. Well, everybody wants some space rock. I wouldn't mind some space rock, honestly, for a good price. Yep. And if and it was certified on- space rock. If you use the ThinkGeek Jupiter Broadcasting link, you can go over to ThinkGeek. And I believe they sell teeny tiny little chips of what they believe is Mars. These are meteorites that have come down that they're pretty sure are from Mars. So you can buy a teeny tiny little piece of Mars, but use the Jupiter Broadcasting link. I love it. All right. Let's talk about uh, December 17th, 1903, 108 years ago. Something pretty amazing happened. Yep. The Wright brothers flew their first powered plane. Wow, that's about as amazing as it gets. Yep. 108 Kitty years Hawk, ago. There was cold wind. They decided to fly. They had an a, they attempted to fly a few days before, but uh, they broke the pro- the propellers. They were just made of wood. So they did that and a whole bunch of crazy stuff happened. And so then they tried again today or uh, the 17th in history and they took off. They went about 120 feet in 12 seconds, one, they essentially flipped a coin, I believe, to figure out which brother was going to get to fly. <laughs> and then the other one ran along the wing. Something so incredible and so historic, and it came down to a coin toss. And like when yeah. you lose, you don't just not to be, you don't get to be the guy that, you don't just lose getting to be the guy that did the first flight, but you also yeah. have to stand on the wing. It's like double loss. Yeah. No, I, if I remember correctly, uh, there was these two brothers, and they ha- it was like, that was, the, that was the end of the line. It was this, just these two brothers. Mm. And so they made a promise to their father that to make sure the familiar, fam- family line would continue, that only one would fly at a time. They would never allowed to fly together. They broke that promise so, then. Well, they, they didn't end up breaking that promise. Oh, no. Um, they didn't, one didn't stand on the wing? No, one didn't stand on the wing. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> I've seen pictures of them, though, or, or I guess I just assumed there was another, I just assumed the other guy on the wing was a Wright brother, but I've seen pictures of that, of those early flights with people just standing on the wings as they fly. Now, what you may be seeing, actually, is there is, um, what they did was there was only a handful of people watching this specific flight. They didn't want a whole bunch of mm-hmm. uh, news crews out there. Mm-hmm. So there's one photographer, one teenager from the area, and then I think maybe a couple of um, news reporters that they invited out to the secret location. Okay. And so the, er- the first couple pictures from that, one of them is flying only about 12 feet high and the other brother is running on the ground. Oh, okay. Sort of watching the wings, watching how he's flying, kind of like calling out, you know, this side's low, that side's low. God, just how sort exciting. Of running along with it. Wow. Could you imagine the adrenaline rush of that? Oh my gosh. Yeah. All right. And- um, anything, anything else on that one? Uh, I believe at one point they had a plane that flew a couple hundred feet in the air and they actually convinced uh, their father to sort of tandem on with him. So ride right, two people on it. And it was like their dad was like, that was the most exciting thing of my life ever. Oh, oh, they gave Pops a good ride for, uh, yep. for and good for him. Good for them. All right. Yep. There you go. That was there you go, folks. That's that happened this week in science. One hundred and eight years ago. Pretty yep. awesome. And uh, you can check the show notes for info on that. All right. Are you ready to uh, look up into the sky? Yes. What do we got? Well, in this last week, as sometimes happens, the, the NASA Solar Dynamics Observatory saw something kind of weird with the sun. There was this cloud of plasma. It was sort of a, a ribbon type thing, if I recall correctly. A cloud of plasma? It sounds like something from sci-fi. 
Yep. It was just sort of hanging out in the sun. It was a fairly big piece that they'd been watching. And a chunk of it just sort of um, eclipsed another part. So it sort of got in the way. So it sort of, it was really strange, but it was an interesting event. Huh. That one piece got in front of another. And so they were, with that, they were able to see how the light from the thing behind it oh. shone through this darker piece. Wow. And they were actually able to learn more about what the darker piece of the sun was. Huh. So they were able to analyze the light from that and be like, huh, this is made up of this specific materials. That, you know what that is right there? Science. That's a science one-up. I have a very special science one-up, and I'm going to give them a correct ding for doing that, too, because that's awesome. Oh, yeah. I love watching these videos, too, of the sun. I mean, um, are, are the videos you have in the show notes, are these, like, real or are these simulations? No, these are real. We just have, like, cameras all over this thing. We're just, like, getting, we're getting shots of the sun from multiple different angles these days. Oh, yeah. We have quite a few orbiting the Earth. We have... The two spacecraft right. that are in front of Earth's orbit and, you know, behind Earth's orbit so we can see 360 degrees of the sun now. You know, yeah. and it's just all of these images close up, far away, watching what it's doing. You begin to wonder, you're like, is that real? Yeah, is that no, I am. I mean, I'm just looking at this. I'm like, I mean, I just, I'm watching this video. I'm like, oh, yeah, there's a far off distant shot of the sun. Okay, that's great. That's fantastic. Mm-hmm. And then as it proceeds, they're like, and here's that same thing from a different angle. Now, here's that same thing from a different angle. And when you think about the size of the sun and what it would take yeah. to get different angles of that thing, it was just, yeah. it's just awesome. Oh, it's crazy. It, we really are living in 2011. And things like this remind me of that. That's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What else we got? Well, uh, the moon this week. Well, that's right. It is uh, Regulus. The bright star in Leo the Lion is going to sit to the upper left of the moon. So, um, Upper left. On Thursday. Okay, on Thursday so the it's upper be left. There. Okay. Now, Mars is going to start creeping close to it um, Friday just after midnight. So it's going to start being around it. Okay, okay. I got to remember these. So there are some, when there we're are out for a drive, stars. Andrew always asks me, and I always like, oh, shoot, Heather sit on side, but I have to remember. So, okay, yep. so Friday is Mars. Yep. Friday and Saturday, Mars is going to start to be around the moon. It'll, I believe Saturday is the last quarter moon. Okay. So there are other stars that are really bright around it, but it is until Friday or Saturday that it's actually a planet, and that'll be Mars this time. There you go. Mm-hmm. Very cool. Uh, wow. Is that, is that bringing us to the end of this week's show? I think so. That's awesome. All right, everyone. Well, uh, SciBite does come out every single Wednesday for download over jupiterbroadcasting.com. Usually we have a video version that goes along with it as a companion, although I don't know what we'll have this week since we locked up halfway through it, but we'll have something for you guys up there. You can get you can grab that over jupiterbroadcasting.com or on the YouTube channel, youtube.com slash jupiterbroadcasting. Heather, another great week of science. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. You bet. And uh, everyone, be sure you uh, tune in live because you can catch SciBite live over at jblive.tv on Tuesdays at 7.30 p.m. Pacific. And uh, then we release it uh, later on. But if you want to join the live chat room, we encourage you to do that over at jblive.tv on 7.30 p.m. Pacific on Tuesdays. All right, everyone. Well, thanks so much for watching this week's episode or listening to this week's episode of SciBite. And we'll see you right back here next Wednesday.